Hi, this is Yvonne Bunn with Home Educators Association of Virginia and today we're going to be talking about testing and testing is coming up sooner than you think. Uh, we always need to start thinking about it in January in order to prepare and order our test and find out what we're uh, planning to do and, and make those plans so that we're not rushed by the end of the year, uh, end of the school year, so that um, we're all set for what could be um, a great experience and we hope it will be a good experience for you. So we're going to be talking about testing and if you have testing questions, uh, please um, write your testing questions down and uh, in Facebook and send them to us. As soon as I finish talking through uh, the different aspects of testing and the different choices that you have, I'll, I'll be taking those questions. And if I haven't answered them, I'll try to go ahead and cover the things that um, that are important to you, and uh, we'll look at see and see if we can't get the answers to those specifics. So. Um, let's start today and first talk about who needs to show academic progress. And that's really what it's called. It could be testing or it could be an evaluation that we're going to be uh, having with our children at the end of the school year. And so who needs to show this academic progress that we're talking about? Generally, if you filed a notice of intent mm -hmm. form or you've written a letter, then you would need to supply a test or an independent evaluation to the superintendent. So you're going to do some type of evaluation that shows that your child is making progress and you're going to send it to the same place that you sent your notice of intent, which is your division superintendent. So basically, if you filed a notice of intent, pay close attention because the law requires you to provide some evidence that your child is making academic progress as you're homeschooling them. However, I want to let you know too that there are exceptions to testing. And so if you fit in one of these categories, pay attention to this because that means that you do not have to test or you do not have to send in an evaluation this school year. First of all, if you're under religious exemption, you, don't, you are not required by the law to send in any testing or any evaluation results. Uh, under religious exemption, it's as if you uh, do not exist any longer. And so testing is not part of the law under religious exemption. You are exempt from compulsory attendance laws, and that means you're also exempt from testing because you're no longer under compulsory attendance laws. If you homeschool, you're fulfilling compulsory attendance laws, and so you do have to meet those requirements. Also, if your student is taught by a certified teacher or a certified tutor, if you're a certified teacher and you're teaching your children and you did not file a notice of intent and check option two on that notice of intent, which is a certified tutor or teacher, if you filed as a certified tutor or teacher mm -hmm. under 22.1-254A and you wrote a letter to the division superintendent's office and you sent it to him along with your credentials and you indicate that you're teaching your child under the certified tutor statute instead of the homeschool statute, then you are not required to supply evidence of progress at the end of the year. Also, if your child is graduated, regardless of your child's age, they could graduate when they're 16 or 17. If they have graduated, again, they are not under compulsory attendance laws and it's not required that you send anything in. And lastly, if your child was not six on September 30th when the school year began, testing is not required. I'll say that again. If your child was not six, on September 30th, last September 30th, when this school year began, then you are not required to send in any evidence of progress, a test or an evaluation. Just to clarify that, it doesn't have to do with whether your child is a kindergarten student or not. It's totally related to the age of your child on September 30th. So if you had a five-year-old last September 30th, testing is not required this year. But if your child was six years old on September 30th, when school began, whether he's kindergarten or first grade, you do have to provide 
academic achievement results. So it's the age, not the grade that your child is in that really makes a difference with that. So what type of testing can you do? There are two things, and I, I use the word testing, but there are two ways that you can show evidence of achievement. The first way would be with a standardized achievement test, and the second way would be an evaluation. And we're going to talk about both of those uh, two things separately. And let's talk about testing first of all, because most people do provide testing scores for the superintendent's office. And so when you provide the testing scores, there are different types of tests that you can use. And we consider these standardized achievement tests. These are norm referenced achievement tests. That's what the law requires. They would be things like um, the Stanford achievement test, the Iowa basic achievement test, the comprehensive test of basic skills, the TB, um, uh, CTBS, um, the California Achievement Test, the Iowa Test, all of these are probably tests that we may have taken in school ourselves. They're filling in the bubble type of um, standardized achievement tests. So all of these different types, including the Woodcock-Johnson or the Brigance Test, they are considered standardized achievement tests. So any of those tests would be acceptable. These tests do not have to be approved before you um, buy them by the superintendent. Uh, in any way, it's totally your choice. And of course, you're going to cover the cost of these tests also. And they would be from about $25 to $50 or $75 per child. And that includes the scoring of the test and sending the scores back to you also. So uh, that's basically the cost of those tests. When your child takes the test, it's important to understand also that they're not required on a standardized achievement test to take all parts of the test. The score that the superintendent is looking for that the law requires is the composite score. And the composite score is only made up of language arts and mathematics. Now, language arts and mathematics have different components to them. Language arts may have spelling, it may have um, comprehension, reading comprehension, it may have uh, syntax, it may have vocabulary. Uh, different tests have different uh, things that are, would be under um, this part of the test. And of course, um, mathematics would be word problems and it would be computation. You'd at least have two different sections of that. And so once your children finish those parts of the test, they are not required to complete history or science. So you can just stop. It does not um, affect their score in any way because the only score that counts for this is the composite score. And the composite score, in order for you to continue to homeschool, needs to be at the fourth stay nine, which is 23 percentile or higher in order for you to continue homeschooling. Now, you can have a subscore or one of the components of language arts or mathematics that may be a little lower than 23 percentile, but what you're looking at and what the superintendent should look at is the composite score, which is compiling those with a formula that they use. They compile those scores to make a composite score. So your composite score needs to be in the 23rd percentile, which is the fourth stay nine or higher. If your child takes the test and surprises you with a score that's the composite score that's lower than that, then I would suggest that you test early enough so that you have an opportunity to either retest or do an evaluation and send that in instead of, an independent, instead of a standardized achievement test. It could very well be that your child was not well that day, they weren't concentrating, they didn't want to take the test. Uh, it could be something that you may need to figure out before you send those test scores in. And I would certainly encourage you to give us a call so that we can talk with you before you send those test scores in and talk to you about other options and other things that, that we could do. So, um, so standardized achievement tests are a fairly reasonable way to show academic achievement. Um, you can decide on how you want the test administered, you can do it over a period of a couple of days, just doing 30 minutes a day, an hour a day. 
You could do it over the course of a week if you wanted to. Whatever works for your child, and it, especially if your child has test anxiety and they're just not sure, they're scared, they know this is important. So you might want to just do little small sections each day. And in that case, you could do 20 or 30 minutes uh, of testing and do it every day until you finish the entire test. And that may relieve a lot of stress on your, on your children. So another question we often have with testing is who can administer the test? And the key thing about this is you need to follow the requirements of the test uh, publisher. And they have rules and regulations about who can administer the test. Um, sometimes they require a qualified administer um, to do someone who can it has experience in teaching. Sometimes they require that. And other companies will allow a parent um, who can read and test their child and follow the testing uh, directions in an ethical way. And as long as you can do that, they'll let you test. Some of them require you to test your own children, but with another family or other children. So make sure that you're aware of the test public publisher's requirements so that you can follow those. You can also check with your local support group. Sometimes local support groups will take one test and they'll bring in um, uh, people to uh, do the testing for a group and you may be able to test in a group with your local support group and that's um, sometimes um, very cost effective. You may be able to do it for less. It may cost a little bit more but then you're not testing your own children. Sometimes uh, your child may uh, actually respond to another person better than they would respond to you. So um, it's completely up to you. Check with your support group about the fees and and um, we also have a list on the HEAV website of where you can get your test. Um, we have not only the test with a, a description, but we also have the company's uh, name, uh, address, uh, email or um, website address, as well as phone number and the cost of the test. So uh, go to the HEAV website at HEAV.org, look under the law, and then testing. And we have lots and lots of information on our testing page. And many of the things that I'm going over today you can review on that page. Um, the law requires no specific uh, information about the test administrator or the test or the evaluator. Um, there's nothing that has to be pre-approved, neither the test nor the evaluator have to be pre-approved in order for you to do your testing. So you can go ahead and, um, and do that without advanced uh, pre-approval. That is not required by the law. Although I've known some superintendent's offices who have written letters uh, requesting that they know who, who the tester is and what test you're going to use prior to the time you administer the test. Uh, they may want that information, but the law does not require you to submit anything uh, to them regarding that. Um, the second thing, if you think your child may not do well on a standardized achievement test because they're anxious about it, because they have a learning disability, because they have attention deficit or something that may prevent them from, from really showing what they are capable of doing, by using that type of test. The other option that you have is an evaluation. And we often call this an independent evaluation. Uh, the law just refers to it simply as an evaluation. But it's an option that parents have if you prefer not to do a standardized achievement test. And in that case, um, you would simply um, have a person uh, evaluate your child who is licensed to teach in any state. So it's a licensed certified teacher, but it does not have to be a Virginia licensed teacher, a teacher that's licensed to teach in any state, or it could be a person with a master's degree or higher and in any academic discipline. And we checked. Um, we did a um, search on the web. I did it myself to find out what does it mean when they refer to an academic discipline. Exactly what does that mean? Well, an academic discipline is basically any subject that's taught at the college level or higher. That's an academic discipline. So um, it, you can have your child evaluated by a person, to, person who's licensed to teach in any state or a person with a master's degree or higher in any academic discipline. Um, and um, they would 
evaluate your child and they would write a letter stating how they have evaluated your child and stating that your child is making adequate progress in order to continue on to the next grade or, or in order to continue homeschooling, whatever they would like to say. Now, often the question comes up, and especially from evaluators, what do you include when you evaluate a child? How do you evaluate a child? And there are several different ways that an evaluator could um, look at the work of your child and write a letter. The first thing they could do is they could interview your child. They could talk to your child. Your child could give them feedback. Or they could also do what we would call a criterion reference test. This is simply a test that the evaluator would make up. The evaluator can look at the work that your child has done. They can look at language arts and mathematics textbooks that you have, the work that your child has done, and they could make up a test taking problems or samples from each of the chapters that your child has completed during the year, and they could um, make up a test that maybe would take 30 minutes or an hour for your child to finish, and then they grade the test themselves. And they would write an evaluation letter based on the results of the criterion reference test that they provided themselves for your child. Um, they could also review samples of your child's work. And um, this is something that we would often call a portfolio. And a portfolio is simply um, taking perhaps the best language arts and mathematics paper that your child does every week of the school year and putting it in a notebook or a three ring binder so that the person who is evaluating your child's work can see from the beginning of the year to the end of the year what your child has done and how your child has progressed. So um, you can have this sample uh, prepared. You have to uh, think ahead and you have to prepare this ahead of time. So you want to start at the beginning of the year or as soon as you start homeschooling your child with samples of the best work that they've done so that the evaluator can look at it and they can say, I can see he's made progress. In other words, he can do more at the end of the year than he could do at the beginning of the year. So he's made academic progress. And the benefit of doing this type of evaluation is the child is not compared to other children his age or in his grade level, the way a standardized achievement test does. The, your child is compared to himself. Uh, the evaluator is looking at the level of work that your child could do at the beginning of the year and comparing it to what he can do at the end of the year. And this portfolio method uh, can be used and then the evaluator would write a letter indicating the progress that has been made. So, um, and in that evaluation letter, it can just be a one, two, three page letter depending on how much of the, how much evaluation or what type of evaluation um, the person has done. But this would just be a report. They would write in the report um, what their credentials are, what their background is, what their experience is working with children, how they evaluated their, your child, um, how your child did, what their, your child's strengths and weaknesses are, um, but still indicating that your child is making progress. And of course, this letter should come back to you and you mail it to the division superintendent's office. And it is up to the division superintendent to determine from the letter that's written by the evaluator whether or not your child has made enough progress to continue homeschooling. So it is a subjective uh, decision that the uh, superintendent is going to make based on the letter that is written. Don't ever assume that your uh, evaluator is going to send that letter to the superintendent. Uh, hopefully he or she will, but maybe not. It's the parent's responsibility to do that. Plus you want to photocopy that letter before you send it also and keep it in your records for your child. So don't assume that somebody else is going to uh, take care of sending it to the superintendent. You make sure that you do that and that it gets there. And uh, of course you can always send it certified return receipt. That way you know that the um, information has gotten to the superintendent, they have signed for it, that they have received it, and you get a postcard back indicating that they have received it and the date and the time, and you know that you've sent it in before the deadline. And the deadline for both the um, 
testing as well as an independent evaluation, the deadline is August 1st each year after you've homeschooled. And that also includes if you decide to homeschool during the middle of the year, say you've just started here in January or February or whenever you've decided, even if you started in May, you're going to need to turn in standardized achievement tests or an evaluation uh, letter to the superintendent's office by August 1st, every year after you have filed that notice of intent, regardless of the date that you filed that notice of intent. So make sure that you get that in. Um, portfolio, well, I've just talked about that. It could be evaluated either by the person with a master's degree or it could be evaluated by a person um, who is a certified teacher or has a teaching license also. And then there are other ways that you can evaluate your child's work. And uh, these are things that maybe work a little bit better when your child is in high school. But there are other options for evaluations that the law allows too. And one of them is a report card. If your child is enrolled in a correspondence course and uh, it's a full enrollment and you have at least language arts and mathematics, but uh, probably other subjects also, and they send you a quarterly report card or however often they do this, then you can take that report card and you can send in the report card by August 1st also. And uh, in that situation, you would have had to have checked off the third option on your notice of intent form and that indicates you're using a correspondence course or a distance learning course. And so if you've checked off option three and you have a report card that comes to you from your child's work that the correspondence course or distance learning program has provided for you, then you can send in that report card and not have to do an evaluation or standardized achievement test at all. Another way that you can show an evaluation is through a transcript from a community college. And this would be if your child is taking language arts and mathematics at least, or if they're enrolled in a community college and taking other courses. But um, you can send in a copy, a photocopy of the transcript that your student gets from the community college also. And then last, you can send in the results of a PSAT test, SAT, or an ACT test, because though, as long as it's equivalent to the fourth stay nine or higher, and they have um, a way of figuring that out. So uh, when you get those reports back, you can see what stay nine your child is in. And so again, the PSAT, the SAT, and the ACT scores, which would be at high school level, can be submitted instead of um, standardized achievement tests or any other type of evaluation. So, um, so make sure you send in all of those results by August 1st every every year that your child um, is being homeschooled. The question also comes up often, well, what do I do with my 12th grader, my senior? Um, by June, my senior is graduated, and uh, August 1st is when the testing has to be turned in or the evaluation. What should you do in that situation? Well, remember the purpose of the testing is so that you can continue to homeschool. Your child is showing enough progress that you can continue to homeschool the following year. Of course, if your child is graduated, he's not under compulsory attendance laws any longer. So you're not required to send in standardized achievement tests by August 1st for that senior who's already graduated. So, um, you know, there's no reason to take a, a test or turn anything in that senior year. Now, if you wanted to, as a courtesy, you could also uh, call the school and just let them know that your child is graduated and um, you know he's not under compulsory attendance laws and you won't be sending any further information to them. The law does not require you to do that. If you would feel more comfortable doing that, um, you can certainly um, make a phone call and make sure that that, that, that happens. Um, a question also that we often get is how, how early should you test? I would recommend considering March, April, or May to test. Um, with a standardized achievement test, they are going to be comparing your child to other children who have taken that same test 
at the same time of the year that your child did. So you don't have to feel like you, you have to finish all the work in May or June before you do a standardized achievement test. That's taken into consideration uh, with the scoring of the test. So uh, March, April, or May would be good months to begin. And one of the reasons that you would want to do that, if there's a problem, if there's something that comes up that you were not expecting as far as the score goes, that gives you an opportunity to either retest or to do something else. So um, it's a, a, good, a good time. The earlier you do it, the better it is for your child. You can relax. You can be finished with it, not be concerned about it. So I would not wait definitely would not wait any later than June because that's really cutting it close. It could take as long as six weeks to get the results back. Most companies, it doesn't take that long, but you never know. And suppose they lose it in the mail and you're waiting and waiting and you don't get anything back and you contact them and they never got a test from you. So that's, that's put you in a very, very difficult situation. Uh, I would say I've known that to happen and I've also been aware of superintendents that have, you know, once you call and say this is what has happened, uh, I have known them to work with parents, but you, you can't guarantee that. You, you just don't know what the situation is going to be. Another test that we have, in fact, I had a phone call on this not too long ago, what, and it was regarding a child who was a struggling reader, and the parent wanted to know what accommodations she could give for her son who was a struggling reader. Can she do a test that's uh, on a different grade level? Could she read the test to him? What can she do uh, to help him with the test? And um, that's a hard, hard question, but you do have some options. Generally, um, if your child has not been diagnosed with a learning disability, you would want to go ahead and give him the standardized achievement test that is most appropriate for him, which should be the grade level that he would be in. You would give him that test and without accommodations because you need to know where is he compared to these other children? You know, what are his weaknesses? What do I need to work on to get him up to speed and to help him to do better and accomplish more work or uh, get over the hump in some area of English that, or work on his reading? What do you need to do? So typically, if your child is not diagnosed with a learning disability, then you would want to give him a regular test and uh, follow the directions of the publisher and make sure that, um, that, you know, if the test is low, then of course your other option is, if you test early enough, your other option is to uh, then turn to an independent evaluation and have someone evaluate his work from the beginning of the year to the end or give him a criterion reference test or interview him or do some type of evaluation. If you do evaluate your child with a test and you send that in and the score is low, if you have um, an IEP from the public schools or an SEP that they have given you if you've taken your child out of school, it may be helpful to attach a copy of that to, um, to the test results to help them understand. It's not necessary. It's not required by law. Um, I think you should probably consider getting him evaluated. We always want to hope that our children will mature and they will be able to do this work better next year as they get a little older or have a little bit more experience with school, but sometimes that doesn't happen. And the longer we put off evaluating our children, um, Sometimes it just makes school such a struggle for them. And there are things out there that can help our children. There are methods of teaching. There are things that deal with dyslexia, with attention deficit disorder. Um, there are ways that we can help our children. So we want to make sure that if you seriously think there is a learning issue here, that something's just not right, go ahead and have your child evaluated by um, a certified teacher who's been trained in this in special needs who can uh, do tests that will help your child or uh, a physician or a psychologist or someone who can help you along the way to know how to structure your day and the curriculum and fit the learning style of your children. So um, that's an important thing to do. So. 
Um, I'm happy to take questions. There could be things that I've just missed covering for you, and I, I want to make sure that during this time uh, we can get as many of your questions answered as possible. So um, let me look here and see if there are any questions on the phone. I'll try to scroll down and see. There's a question from um, Lena that says, so the fourth, whoops, I'm sorry, let me see if we can get rid of that. It says, um, so the fourth Stainine score for PSAT changes each year. Um, I don't know that it, if it does change, it would not be much. So I don't think you need to be real concerned about that. Uh, for the PSAT because it, it, it may change some based on the group of children that are being tested nationally. But I would not think it would be anything that you need to be particularly concerned about. Um, so you can look at that. And if the score is not what you want on the PSAT mm -hmm. or the SAT, then uh, of course you can do um, standardized achievement test on that. So, um, all right, let's see if there's anything else here. Okay, um, we've got our evaluations op evaluation options posted on our website. Don't forget to go there and learn some more about testing also. Um, and we also have lots and lots of people, um, testers that are on our website at our um, HEAV.org, so you can go there and um, look at that. Let's see, here's a question here. It says, my son has high-functioning autism. Anything I need to do uh, in addition for him? I would definitely plan on having an evaluation done. And also, when you choose an evaluator, make sure that you um, choose an evaluator that will work with you the way you want them to, that your test will be your child will be evaluated in a way that you want him evaluated. And so depending on his speech development or his interaction with other people, um, make sure that you get an evaluator that you feel comfortable with and that you know will work with your child. But I would definitely make sure that, um, that you uh, talk with the evaluator ahead of time. Um, maybe now would be a good time to start looking for an evaluator to find out how she wants to evaluate your child and make sure that you're happy with the way um, she wants to proceed and it's something that you can agree uh, agree with her on so that was that would be the main thing that I would suggest that you do um, another question from Donna Donna says can you send your notice of intent and test scores in together or should they be sent separately I would suggest that um, you could do it either way if you send it in together you've um, you know a lot of people do that it's one package um, and uh, you've mailed it and you know it's done and so it's completely up to you. It doesn't hurt to do that at all, but there are two separate dates that you need to be aware of. One is the um, testing is due August 1st and the notice of intent um, is due August 15th, but there's certainly no harm in sending them in together before August 1st. So um, I wouldn't send in a notice of intent before the school year is out. Um, I wouldn't send anything in before say May uh, but sometime in June or July or whenever your test scores are ready, I think it's okay to do that if, you, if you'd like to do that. Okay, and let's see. Um, okay, Heather. All right, let's see. I have to keep scrolling up here. I'm sorry for the delay. And see if there are any more questions here that we can cover. Um, get your questions in if there's anything else. Um, Amy says she always tests at the end of May. That's good. That's good. All right. Um, let's see if there's anything else here that we need to go over. Um, Miriam asks, she says, I presume these are Virginia requirements. Yes, they are requirements for the state of Virginia, and every state has different requirements. Some states don't even require testing uh, or evaluation, and so Virginia is one that does have that accountability issue in the law, so uh, that's true. 
Um, and let's see um, if there's anything else on here. Okay, I'm going to scroll back down to the bottom. Sorry for the camera moving. It's kind of propped here. Oops, kind of propped here on top of my computer. So let me go down to the bottom just to make sure I haven't missed anything else here. And Sandra, if there's anything I've missed, let me know so that uh, we can cover this. Uh, but I do want you to know that we have lots of information again on our website and we have lists of testers. We also under um, testers, tutors, and counselors. They are listed um, on our website, the HEAV website at, at um, www.heav.org. And also um, we have the testing uh, information about where you can get tests. We also have information on the benefits of testing as well as um, other resources. Uh, we have practice tests on there. There's a company um, that we have a link to that you can actually do a practice test with your child just to kind of get a feel for what might be going on with that. So, um, okay, I think we've covered everything on here and I'm hoping that um, this has been a help to you. We can always answer more of your mm -hmm. questions um, when we, if you want to give us a call, I'm happy to talk with you. I've had a couple of phone calls while we've been on, on this webinar um, and um, um, Facebook uh, chat time. So I'm glad to take your questions over the phone. You can call the HEAB office, but go to our website. I think you'll find lots of help, lots of encouragement. Testing can really be a good thing because not only do you know that you're doing a good job, and, and but you know how well your child is doing and you're doing a good job also. And so it can be very, very rewarding. So I hope this has been helpful to you. Uh, you can call the HEAV office at 804-278-9200. We have counselors that can talk with you about the law, about testing, about how to begin homeschooling. Uh, any homeschool issues, we will be happy to talk with you about and see if we can find the answers. Thanks so much for being with us today, and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Bye-bye.